Okay, I think that's my cue in. So uh, again, welcome everybody. Good morning and welcome to this um, dissemination event for the Crover Grain Swimming Robot. This is a project that's been uh, funded by the Science and Technology Facilities Council. Uh, and it's a project we've been working on with Crover for I think it's 18 months in total and it's just come to an end. Uh, so my name is Duncan Ross. I am the Business Development Manager for Agri Epicenter. And uh, next slide, please. So part of this dissemination event, uh, I'm going to speak a little bit myself, uh, and then I should be handing over to John Knight, who is a non-executive director of Crover, and he's going to be speaking about issues and costs around sampling and testing. Um, I think I'm slightly out of order here. So uh, Robert Neal will then take over, and Robert is the owner of Up in Isbit Farm, which is an agri epicenter uh, satellite farm, and he's going to give us a farmer perspective uh, on storing grain. And then finally, we'll be handing over to Lorenzo, who is the Managing Director of Crover. Um, and they'll be talking about the actual workings of the grain swim robot and the benefits that it can potentially bring. Uh, as part of this event, we'll be having a Q&A session at the end, which will kick off with a couple of poll questions, which we'd like you to engage with. Uh, that should take a couple of minutes. Then we'll have a panel session. Uh, so if you'd like to put comments and questions in the chat function on the right hand side of your screen, and also, if you want to introduce yourself, please feel free to do that and uh, an introduction about yourself and perhaps your email address if you want to reach out to people. And then finally, there will be a 30 minutes networking session where we, the panel, will drop out of this um, and join you on the other uh, on the other side, if you like. There's two separate streams running at the same time. OK, next slide, please. So just a little bit about Agri Epicenter from myself. Um, Next slide, please. So Agri Epicenter are one of the four Agritech centres uh, set up by Innovate UK Funding. Uh, we work with numerous tech developers, academics and end users uh, to try and understand problems uh, and develop solutions to problems, particularly on farm. Um, we build collaborations around those ideas. So again, engaging with tech developers and academics and uh, looking at where we can take these uh, potential projects to farm to actually help develop these solutions. We actively source funding opportunities um, from many, many sources, um, and these help to bring those collaborations to life if we're able to write successful um, bids and are funded to uh, work on these projects. We are also project partners within projects. We help with uh, project management, we deploy assets, we can bring our assets into projects if they're relevant to particular projects they're working on. And we do knowledge exchange events such as this one to try and disseminate the activities of that particular project to a wider audience to, for awareness. Next slide, please. So how do we do some of this work? Well, our UK satellite farm network is key part of the things that we do. So it's a, a model for engagement, measurement and testing. Uh, so there's 28 farms across the uh, UK, uh, and there's more coming on stream. We have a wide geographical coverage, commodity coverage, but also in terms of um, weather and soil types. This model has been extended to South America, Asia and Australasia. So we're working overseas as well as in the UK. Uh, we're incubating and demonstrating emerging agritech, such as the Grover um, Grain Swim Robot. This is a particular good example of how we bring that sort of incubation through the through the, the um, demonstration and research. It's very much farm focused, like I said before, about developing solutions to problems we have on farm. Uh, we work in partnership and collaboration, uh, so building those collaborations with tech developers and academics and end users and identifying and breaking down barriers to productivity and productivity on farm obviously needs to improve um, in terms of efficiency and output uh, for less input. And that helps us bring best practice to the fore uh, to encourage people to aspire to doing things better. Uh, and like I said before, knowledge exchange, both internally and externally, such as events like this. Uh, next slide, please. So we have an innovation network. And if we look to the left hand side of the screen, we have the ideations. This is where ideas uh, are presented. So they may be ideas internally, 
There may be ideas that come from farmers and certainly ideas that come from tech developers who have um, probably come from university background, have some very sort of novel ways of, of, of thinking about how they can solve some of the problems that they, uh, they envisage. So we go through this process on the design side and we look at the requirements analysis, which involves speaking to many people to understand what the actual issues are and are we actually solving a real problem? And that goes through the design uh, stages from a high level design to more detail. And then we get to the prototype stage where we can start implementing, implementing some of that testing, uh, working on the testing side of things, probably more in the lab to start with, and then taking that out to a more um, commercial sort of setting and actually do some co-development on farm. And that development goes through the TRL, TRL stages until hopefully we end up with a commercial solution to the problem that was identified right back at the ideation stage. Next slide, please. So in terms of grain quality, growers invest an awful lot of money and time in producing the best possible crop they can to meet their target market. Uh, that would be selecting the best varieties, sowing into good conditions, uh, selecting you know the the correct level of inputs of fertilizer and agrochemicals and targeting those um, but also harvesting and drying equipment is expensive so it's an expensive process to actually go through that stage of producing grain so you want to keep it when you've harvested it in the best possible quality next slide please now this is an example of uh, a piece of kit we have deployed on some combines on some of our satellite farms, which is the Next Instruments Crop Scan 3000. Uh, it's a near infrared scanner and it's mounted on the clean grain elevator and that can map across the field as the combine is working uh, grain quality. So it measures protein, moisture and oil content. And the aim behind that is potentially you can then see where the quality grain is in your field and perhaps the less quality and you can segregate those to meet the premium markets and we've been trying these on satellite farms uh, two satellite farms around the country and we've actually bought some more units for this coming season next slide please so just an example of the difference in premium quality so these are just some figures i've plucked off of the hdb website on the 17th of february obviously things have changed significantly now due to the ongoing conflict in ukraine but you can see there the difference between bread milling wheat feed wheat malting barley and feed barley so there's a, a, a serious financial premium in uh, hitting those target markets and if you do have losses in store uh, that actually gets that grain rejected and takes it down to the feed level, so feed wheat or feed barley, then obviously you're losing money. Uh, and potentially you can even be worse. You could lose it altogether. If you have real problems, you could lose the value of that crop altogether. So it really needs concentration and thought into effective storage to ensure that grain stays in really good condition. And monitoring stores for anything that may give rise to spoilage so that could be temperature, moisture, mold, and pests. Uh, I think, next slide, but I think that might be, that is, that's me. So with that, um, rattling on anymore, I would like to hand over to John Knight. And John is a non-executive director on Crover. And he will be speaking to us around the issues of sampling within Grain Store. So over to you, John, thank you. Okay, thank you, Duncan. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, maybe useful to, to say that I, I was going to say dabbling in the area of grain storage for the last 30 years, but had various research projects over that time. Um, and I think it, it is all around the point that Duncan made about preserving that quality. And sometimes it's, it's quite difficult to persuade people that you actually need to be proactive uh, in that exercise when the grain goes into store. Um, I guess the, uh, the commonly uh, said thing is that people shut the doors and expect it to be in the same condition when they take it out again without necessarily uh, putting in the hard work to maintain it at the quality level that it goes in at. Um, so this is all really about monitoring, sampling, um, and to some extent testing, but the requirements that are necessary to give you a reliable sample that you're comfortable with and probably even more so your buyer is comfortable with and accepting the numbers that come back from that exercise. 
So I think it, it's, uh, yeah, the, the, the issue really is making sure that you have uh, a well-organized, reliable, um, I guess, something that you can be confident in, in terms of monitoring the grain that's in your store. And as you will know, hopefully, it is uh, not without a lot of effort in many cases, especially shortly after harvest or even during harvest when you're trying to monitor the store uh, alongside doing uh, the rest of the harvest or autumn cultivations or everything else. So it does require time, it does require effort. And quite often that is down to a manual process of walking around within the store, uh, taking gra grain samples, often from substantial bulks of grain, uh, not always in the safest of conditions. Um, and I guess there is a, uh, perhaps a, a tendency to, to take fewer samples than you might otherwise um, seek to do or someone like me would tell you to do. So I think that what we're looking at here is to try and improve the amount of information we have about the grain and therefore improve the decision making and therefore hopefully have better outcomes with either uh, maintaining that quality and therefore the margins um, or reducing any subsequent damage that might occur through detecting a potential problem. So I think really there's um, first thing to do is that this is you know it's not an alternative to storing grain well you still need to put in the groundwork you still need to have a good store um, you still need to uh, have all the equipment there uh, for intake drying uh, cooling, um, uh, aeration to, to maintain the proper conditions. So, you know, a good store is, is fundamental to that, but even good stores sometimes go wrong. Um, so you need to be able to react to anything that happens during that storage process. And one of the ways in which people um, perhaps fall short is the intensity of the sampling, both in space and time. So fewer samples, less often, Yes, it gives you an idea of what's going on, but if you've got greater spatial uh, uh, density, then you will pick up things much earlier and therefore you can respond more quickly, limiting any uh, loss in quality or indeed uh, loss of grain entirely. Um, and hopefully you can respond with fewer inputs. So whether that's down to putting in a, a sort of a point aeration to, to drop the temperatures or to uh, respond to something or to turn the grain or whatever it might be. So this is all about giving you more data, more knowledge to, to manage uh, the grain better. And clearly you can do that manually, but it takes an awful, awful lot of effort. Um, so it's either labor intensive or you spend a lot of money on sometimes fixed point equipment to monitor in stores which works perfectly well, but it can be expensive. And it also has the overhead that sometimes you've got uh, bits of equipment uh, within the store that makes loading, outloading uh, rather more difficult and sometimes hazardous as well. So I think that that's, that's the issue on store or in store and whether that's on farm or on a large store uh, is, is sort of the same question, but it needs to be done. Um, and the thing about uh, sampling at a greater level of intensity is that as the storekeeper you have a much better idea of what's going on in store and it also allows you to take samples and send them off for testing and to get results on protein or nitrogen or whatever is the key uh, measure for yourself um, and you can have I guess a, a greater um, confidence that the information coming back from that testing is truly representative of what you've got in store. If you're perhaps taking samples off the front of a bulk, which obviously is not uncommon, especially if you've got a very full store, um, you will get a good idea what the sample is like or what the quality is like at the front, uh, but you will have perhaps less idea about how uh, homogeneous the grain is and whether that quality continues back through the store. And obviously, if you're perhaps using one of those uh, uh, new systems on the combine and you're seeing this wonderful quality grain go in, and then you are quite happy that it's all remaining the same, um, I think you might be mistaken. So I think that there's you know, an additional need. If you've got that level of resolution, you want to then be able to work at the same level of, level of resolution in the store uh, to ensure you don't lose that quality along the way. I think the other issue is that um, for certainly sampling, uh, when you look to sell the grain, uh, it's not uncommon to have more than one merchant um, coming looking at the grain. 
And there's a cost to the industry there that each merchant will quite often send someone out to sample the grain um, to, to make their own assessment of the quality uh, and to, to offer a price. So there's a, a, a duplication of effort there, which uh, clearly takes money out of the industry uh, to do that sort of thing. Um, there's the issue of people going on to farm, uh, farm safety, sampling grain, uh, that sort of thing. Um, so how do you get a, a representative sample? Well, the, the key to it is taking lots of little samples uh, throughout a very large bulk, um, which clearly is very time consuming. It tends not to happen that often. Uh, the opportunity for sampling and testing as far as the millers and maltsters uh, are, are, um, are, 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 or from their perspective, is on intake. And at that point, it's possible to sample a truck uh, relatively intensely. Um, and the results that come back from the testing lab uh, tell you what the price you're going to get or whether it should be rejected. Um, and sometimes that comes as a surprise to farmers. Um, and that's because the sampling that sometimes happens on farm is not at a level intensity that gives you full confidence in the results of any tests that you might have had done. So uh, the nasty surprise that suddenly the grain you thought you were going to get uh, a good price for is either downgraded or rejected altogether. So uh, being able to, to get these samples is, is key. Um, and I think that, I mean, 30 years ago, I was talking to people, wouldn't it be nice if we could have a little something that prowled about in the grain and took these samples? Um, and I think that this is probably the point at which we're at now. So being able to sample repeatedly, both in time and space, to monitor changes in the grain over time within the store is key. So you can see where the temperatures are falling, whether they're going up, whether the moisture is uh, stable. Um, and as soon as you notice the difference, you can react and take uh, the correct corrective action. Um, so you can provide a record of your sampling right throughout the period it's in store. You can show any potential buyer that the, uh, the temperatures and the relative humidities have been stable or, or within uh, the, the, uh, the limits that are expected. Um, you have the opportunity to say that, well, we've got a known repeatable method of sampling. It doesn't depend on who's doing the sampling uh, and how hard they push the spear in and, and everything else. Um, so it just takes some of the uncertainty out. It gives you better understanding of the grain. And I think that there's a potential probably across the industry. If you can develop the confidence in a particular piece of equipment, then there's the, the possibility that the data that the farmer would be able to produce uh, and, and sign off on saying this is the monitoring data, um, we can collect samples throughout the entire bulk of the grain, we can give you those samples, you can go off and test them, um, um, but we're pretty confident that they're coming back the same as the ones that we had earlier. So I think, you know, it, it gives an opportunity, um, and uh, the technology will be explained further, but it gives the opportunity for an intensive level of monitoring, um, such that you will have greater confidence, greater knowledge, and therefore uh, the ability to manage the grain much better and maintain that quality within store. So uh, that's me. I shall then pass on to, I think, we'll go back to Duncan to link in. Great, thank you, John. That was really insightful about you know, the problems around uh, sampling particularly and effective sampling. Uh, so now next up uh, is Robert Neal and Robert is the owner of Upper Nisbet Farm. Uh, Upper Nisbet is one of the agri -AP satellite farm network. And um, this is the place where we've been doing the testing for the uh, the Crover robot. So Robert's been engaged with the process right from the start. So Robert, over to you. Thanks, Duncan. And thanks, John. Um, I think uh, the previous two speakers have really touched on everything that I really need to say, but we'll we'll go over some of it. So um, I farm here um, at Upper Nisbet Farm with my wife Jacqueline and two sons, Andrew and Harry, and two members of staff. We grow 400 acres of cereals, uh, 400 hectares of cereals, and we have 290 hectares of grass on the farm. Um, and the grain store uh, was purpose built in 2011 with a weighbridge um, a 3,000 ton grain store, it's split into three bays of um, a thousand uh, ton and with a 30 ton batch dryer on the side of the store. 
So um, we're in, we're in control. A uh, thousand acres of um, cereals. Uh, if it averages three ton an acre, we can store the whole harvest in our store uh, with not moving a drop at harvest time, and we can market um, the grain throughout the the year whenever we feel that we are um, needing to shift grain or feel we have got the best price we can achieve for that grain in store. But um, as the speaker has previously said, uh, harvest is a busy time of year. Putting that grain away in the store is paramount, but corn as a cut probably. Uh, everybody's busy and things maybe shouldn't be done uh, as they should be. Um, so it's a challenge looking after grain in, in, a, in a store um, of this. Um, and probably early in the season is the biggest challenges where the, the harvest weather is it's warmer. The grain is coming in off the field of the combine at a higher temperature. And now normally that is not an issue here in Scotland, um, not compared with the south of the country. Um, but last harvest, we had some extremely warm days, cutting winter barley and grain temperatures were really high. So um, drying wasn't an issue. It was reducing the temperature of the grain to go into the store. So current, you know, monitoring the grain in the store um, throughout the season to make sure that that temperature was dropping was a laborious, tedious job for the staff or myself. Um, climbing over grain heaps, um, taking uh, samples, uh, taking temperatures, moistures to, to make sure it's okay. And people do get caught out. And as I said, corn as a cut. And it, sometimes that people think the grains in the grain store, they shut the door and um, it'll be fine till the day they go in to remove that grain, which um, we all know doesn't happen. So the, the biggest issues, um, temperature, moisture, uh, mold, pests. If you've got rising temperature, rising moisture then you get mold then you get bugs start to live breed and the whole thing just escalates um, out of control um, and at the present um, prices that we are currently re receiving um, for a grain we cannot afford food waste um, the uk is not self-sufficient you know we can only produce enough food from the first of january till the 8th of august and from the 8th of august to the first of january uh, we potentially have no food if we don't import. So um, the days for uh, food waste, grain loss are gone, in my opinion. You know, we, we need every tool in the toolbox to look after what we have got in store. And we need every tool in the toolbox to monitor and make sure that we are getting the full potential, um, the full profitability out of grain that we store. And um, But ha having a grain store on farm uh, long term, um, to store grain and market it throughout the season, uh, in my mind, is beneficial. So this year has just really highlighted that um, feed wheat prices at harvest time were probably at 180, 190, 200 pound. Um, feed wheat on Friday, I could have sold feed wheat out the store on Friday at 308 pound. So that is maximising um, the potential of grain. Now I know it's a bit. It's unfortunate circumstances that these prices have risen. But um, costs for growing this grain, you know, fertilizer has doubled. Uh, fuel costs, energy costs have all doubled, doubled um, in the last 12 months. So um, getting profitability out of grain is really going to be hard um, going forward. And again, I just want to highlight we cannot afford food waste and we have to look after grain in the best manner we can. Um, on farm. Um, so the Crova team, Lorenzo and his team uh, have used our store for the last um, 18 uh, months, I think. Um, so he's had full access to the grain store, bulks of grain, and um, they've come on a monthly basis probably and um, worked away with a full team testing um, their product. And um, so really, I've, I've really left it up until to them to, to, to basically get on with it. But I can see um, this Crova product, um, little robot, um, grain swimmer, burrower, um, whatever you would like to call it, is a game changer for the, the, the game, is a game changer for the industry, you know, and what I would like to see is um, a product like this come into the market um, to make it possible 
to um, sample grain in real time. Uh, yesterday or last week is no good for me. I want real-time information to go into my desktop or my mobile phone, probably. And that's what the younger generation are um, looking for, um, to be able to be storekeepers and look after grain effectively. And if temperature is rising, then you can go into um, the grain uh, store and rectify any problems. Now, if I could have a slide that I've provided. Um, so... Storing grain, uh, this is our store, and unfortunately this was six weeks ago, so we had a, a leaky spot in a roof. So a new grain store, you would think, um, newly built, you wouldn't have any issues, but yes, we have had issues, and um, that is seed grain uh, with a, a roof that was leaking in, in some severe weather that we had in Scotland, and uh, it all germinated and sprouted. So in turn, it um, started to heat, um, there was some bugs started to develop, so we had to act pretty quickly and uh, remove that grain from the store. Um, luckily, we have the dryer on site. We, we uh, put it through the dryer on, on cold air, reconditioned it, and put it back in, and uh, we nipped it in the bud. Um, but unfortunately, there's a new roof um, going to have to go into this store, I think. Um, so, yeah. So, yeah, the best um, will in the world. Problems do arise, but as farmers, um, there's a different challenge every day, and uh, we just go about our daily business and um, rectify or um, sort out these problems uh, when we face uh, when we're faced with them. So, really, that's all I'm going to say. Um, I've witted enough. Um, so, hopefully, there'll be some good questions uh, come. And um, thanks, guys. Thank you, Robert. That was really insightful, and uh, I'm afraid you've been at the the, the the cutting face, shall we say, or the the, uh, the edge of it um, with that problem in store that you've had to actually react to. Um, I guess it's not a typical event in terms of a leaky roof, but I'm sure it does happen elsewhere in the country. Um, a few things I did pick out, the important things that you said there about fruit, food waste and grain loss, and particularly in the current circumstances with what's happening in Ukraine, you know, which is one of the major suppliers of grain in, for the world. Um, but also, I suppose you alluded to the start about the increasing temperatures maybe and climate change. Uh, and if that's happening in the UK, certainly we know it's happening in other parts of the world where they haven't got adequate storage already. Um, and if in the developing world, this is a real major issue that you know their losses are far greater than any we see in this country. But uh, no, thank you for the presentation, uh, Robert. So now I'm going to hand over for the main event um, and Dr. Lorenzo Conti, who will be speaking about the developments they've made in the last 18 months and hopefully will perhaps give us some insight into what their plans are moving forward from here. So over to you, Lorenzo. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Duncan. So as the previous speakers, uh, John and Robert mentioned, when you're storing grain uh, over long periods of time in large bulks, a lot of things can go wrong. Uh, primarily, the focus is in preventing pests like insects and molds, which can develop when temperature and moisture are too high and it's creating a, a nice environment for them to grow. Uh, but also, as uh, John briefly mentioned, uh, if uh, you have a large grain storage operation and you have employees, uh, often you might be concerned with the health and safety of people walking on top of the grain bulk, which are usually not safe environments, especially in uh, silos, where if you sink in, uh, there's usually nothing that can uh, save you. And it's providing an autonomous solution that can avoid people walking on top of the grain bulk can also not only help uh, maintaining the quality of the grain, but also improving the health and safety of uh, a grain storage sites operation. Um, also, over the years, there has been, especially in the UK and in Europe, a growing regulatory pressure to move away from the traditional way of doing things, which is fumigating grain periodically towards what people call integrated pest management uh, practices. And when we talk about integrated pest management, we really talk about uh, accurately monitoring the temperature and the moisture of the grain and making sure that these two parameters within the old bulk remain within a safe threshold within which pests are not able uh, to grow. Accurate integrated pest management, however, requires a data point every 
alpha meter wheat in the entire bulk in all directions and existing systems are not able to provide that hence relying on integrated pest management alone and on inaccurate data uh, as has been available so far um, creates a risk which is even higher than the potential benefit and hence people haven't been able to rely on integrated pest management alone so we usually say that green storage units are a bit like a black box as uh, uh, Duncan mentioned initially there are some good ways of measuring the grain quality as the grain is effectively flowing so from a engineering point of view there are technologies that can measure the quality of a, a small stream of grain uh, but the problem is measuring the quality of grain uh, while it is static in a very large bulk and reaching different areas safely within that bulk so if we look at existing solutions for monitoring uh, bulls of grain, uh, these can be divided in two main classes. We have on the left, uh, manual sampling and direct measurements, which is usually done using manual uh, probes, which are basically long metal sticks that a person has to uh, manually carry while they're working on top of the grain bulk and stick at a few points where they can reach. Um, and then the most advanced uh, solutions, they uh, usually take the form of static sensing solutions. Traditionally, they look like long cables with sensors uh, either at the end or at a few points down the length of that cable. Uh, but because of the cost of the static sensors, it is economically unfeasible to have enough to, to cover uh, you know, that alpha meter grid that we were talking about in all directions and hence they're usually only able to provide uh, uh, you know to detect a problem only once it's grown to a significant size and the only main kind of development in these technologies over the last years has been adding wireless data transfer capabilities to these types of systems which however they still need to be fixed either to with a metal bracket to the wall or to a cable so that they don't get lost in the middle of that grain bulk. So um, as you're, you're probably aware, we are here to talk about uh, the Crover robot that we developed, which is effectively the world's first uh, subterranean drone, uh, or a Crover, as we call it, really because there was no dictionary word to describe a device that can propel itself through granular media in general. Uh, so we're not talking just about uh, uh, grain bulks, but also any environment uh, like uh, sand dunes, uh, mineral bulks, uh, chemical powders, really any system made of solid discrete particles uh, that most interact through contact forces. Uh, now, the way the Crover system works is at the core of it, you have the Crover robot swimming through the grain and equipped with temperature and moisture sensors for now, so that it measures those two parameters as it moves through the bulk of the grain and building a 3D map of conditions of that bulk. As the Crover robot is uh, swimming through the bulk, it also provides some level of in situ mixing of the grain, which helps keeping it aerated. Uh, it helps avoiding problems. Uh, uh, for instance, it, it avoids kind of crusting on the surface and other unoptimal conditions within uh, the grain uh, bulk. Um, now, uh, the reason why we say that it's the world's first subterranean drone is the fact that other people tried before using more classical methods, for instance, ondulatory motion, which is a bit like the, the way a snake moves or peristaltic motion. Uh, so like, like a worm or flapping veins, which is a bit more like a fish. But all those methods, they require some direct displacement to be applied uh, below the surface and ends are unfeasible because drag forces below the surface of granular media are much more significant than you would find in uh, any other type of fluid, even very viscous fluids. And hence, any attempt at uh, building a device that would propel itself below the surface of granular, of dense granular systems, even one centimeter below the surface was unsuccessful. Uh, and when we're saying self-propulsion, we obviously, uh, you know, 
exclude that excludes any attempt that used external uh, prods to to propel the system. Uh, so the old Crover journey started from discovering uh, uh, that there is a coupling between uh, rotational and transitional motion in granular media, which in simple terms means that if you're rotating even a symmetric object like a sphere or a cylinder about a centroid in this type of systems, that rotation and the flow generated by uh, that rotation around the object is uh, enough to generate a pressure differential from one side to the other. So that's really kind of the, the peculiar behavior that is found only in granular media and in no other type of uh, type of material. If you do the same thing in a fluid, nothing happens. So that, that flow generates a pressure differential from one side to the other that effectively moves uh, the object through. So it creates a net transitive force uh, that makes it move by overcoming only um, frictional forces around the rotating part and also that object at that point is moving through a kind of fluidized uh, state as we say where uh, the you know the, the granular packing forces are not as strong as they would be elsewhere uh, within within the medium so it's very as a very localized effect is very efficient and is the first feasible method for moving through these type of environments uh, now luckily we've been already granted a uk patent on that kind of core technology so covering anything that moves through uh, granular media as a result of rotation in a direction mainly perpendicular to the axial rotation and that enabled us to uh, to develop that crover robot that uh, you were seeing. Now, once the Crover robot collects the data, the data is sent to our uh, safe server and visualized on our saving grains app, as we call it, where you can see an overview of the different sites that you have in case you have more than one. And within each site, you can uh, see an overview of the conditions of your different uh, grain storage unit. So here we're just showing an example uh, of a site with uh, with three units and uh, with uh, you know 3D maps of temperature on the right and of moisture on the left on the left uh, with examples uh, of a hot spot and a and a wet spot. Uh, you can also visualize uh, kind of historical views of how uh, the the averages, maximums, and minimums of the grain conditions have changed over time to uh, try to identify. Uh, if uh, there is a, a trend happening and if conditions are getting uh, or are expecting to get out of uh, out of end so that you can act in a timely manner and stop a problem in the early onset before ideally any pests or infestations are able uh, are able to develop this is really the basic version of the app that we've been developing we've got a lot planned in store more data analytics and insights uh, uh, but right now we're really focused on getting the first version of the Crover robot ready uh, commercially uh, with partners like, you know, like Robert's Farm. Uh, and now we also have uh, a few partner sites, uh, both in the rest of the UK and, and in Italy. So here's a bit of a kind of a top level overview of the Crover system. As I mentioned, you've got the Crover robot at the core of it uh, that is connected through a tether to a local control unit. That tether is there mostly to make sure that we don't lose the robot wheat in the grain bulk. Initially, our idea was to develop a fully remote system, but we realized uh, that you know by speaking with grain storage operators, losing or you know potentially losing a crover within the grain bulk was an ideal. And so, while we trying to improve the uh, the reliability of the remote version, we decided to focus on a on a tether version. That local control unit then sends the data to a central gateway where you have one per site communicating with all the crew robot and storage units that you have on that site. And then, uh, you know, as I mentioned, that data is sent to our secure database via an alternative of three channels, depending on what data uh, uh, connectivity is available on site. Uh, so we've got options for both mobile data transfer, Wi-Fi, and in case neither of these two are available, there's also a SATCOM, so a satellite communication back channel, uh, which is a bit more limited, it's a bit more expensive, uh, but can still transfer the data in cases where no other uh, connectivity is available. And then eventually that data is connected to a web app, as Robin was saying, uh, that, that can be visualized through any internet uh, uh, connected device, uh, uh, so whether it is a phone, a smartphone, or a computer, uh, or, a, or a tablet. Um, 
now the we the, the product is not yet fully available commercially as we're still working through pilots and refining some aspect of the project but we're hoping to have the uh, the first commercially available version ready for sale uh, uh, towards the end of uh, the summer uh, to kind of tie in with the new cycle of harvest um, the plan is to offer that uh, the product through uh, two main options, which we're still evaluating further, so we'd be happy to hear any any feedback from the attendees on this. One of the options is a, a yearly service license model, uh, where users would sign up uh, on a kind of minimum term of a few years, uh, somewhere between uh, three to five years minimum, uh, and pay uh, yearly a license fee for both lease of the hardware, management of the data, and access to the web uh, platform, as well as remote uh, uh, support. Uh, the other option is uh, kind of more upfront cost, where you buy the hardware and then pay a license for all the optional uh, data and web app uh, uh, services, depending on what is kind of more... Uh, more suitable for the different type of uh, customer as we realize that uh, because people might have money coming to different routes one route might be more preferable than the other um, so we we obviously touched on uh, the benefits of helping uh, maintain the quality of the grain stock improving the health and safety of the operations and that all ties in with automating the management and the monitoring of the grain bulk uh, also getting a better picture and being able to identify problems in the early onset before um, they've even developed into into pests. These usually have an uh, incubation time that is of a few weeks, so they don't develop instantaneously. Usually, the problem is that you can't detect a problem before it's turned into into an infestation. Um, and also through the service license model, we're trying to kind of make it easier for people uh, not to have to afford that kind of large upfront cost and be able to delay that over time. Um, obviously, uh, for us, uh, as a company, uh, the social and environmental impact of what we're doing is particularly key and is one of the reasons why we decided to start by focusing on the grain storage industry. Um, th there's a lot of angles there, uh, but suffice it to, to mention the fact that uh, about 6% total greenhouse gas emissions, as estimated by FAO, are uh, deriving from uh, uh, mass and quality losses as well as energy consumption uh, in the in the grain storage uh, phase and also the fact that a significant amount of uh, the war food stocks are contaminated by uh, by mycotoxins which are obviously very dangerous for humans and there are very tight uh, limits imposed by uh, by regulators um now in as uh, uh, as we mentioned through, throughout the previous presentations to the project, we've also been developing uh, uh, a slightly alternative uh, module to the Crover, which can be fitted onto the main, uh, onto the main Crover system for sampling grain bulks at different parts of uh, the grain uh, that green bulk. So the system is uh, is fully autonomous, uh, just like the main crew robot is still kind of being piloted, but we'd be happy to talk with more partners who might be interested in, in trying that, whether now or at some point in the future. Um, and it, uh, you know, it moves through the, the grain bulk and collects samples uh, uh, within the bulk at different uh, points. Uh, unfortunately, because of the stage that we're at in uh, the Kind of IP protection of uh, the new, uh, the, those new uh, elements of IP that come into the sampling system. We're not able to to show the latest version of that, uh, but obviously you, you get the gist of what we've been uh, working on. Um, now I know that this presentation is mostly for grain storage uh, operators or people involved in the grain storage industry. Uh, but just for a, a little bit of coolness factor, I'll mention the fact that, uh, you know, beyond green storage, a, a crover could potentially be applied in a lot of other environments. I mentioned sand dunes initially, in case you're a fan of the movie Dune. Uh, but to talk about more realistic stuff, anything from uh, green sampling and exploration on, uh, uh, on Mars and other kind of regolith substrates, 
to helping in the mineral uh, pools industry, in the chemical industry, when handling kind of uh, chemical powders, and generally in any environment where there are bulk solids and uh, powders. Uh, so I'd like to give some credit also to, to our fantastic team who's been working hard uh, throughout the project and on the other developments that we've been uh, we've been working on beyond this this single project. We've got a few other uh, going on, um, and here's kind of our our core team of superstar. Although there's more people that we couldn't really fit into into the slide, and we'd like to thank also our wider network of supporting organizations that have been helping us throughout the journey. Um, so this is really a, a summary. I'm, I'm sure there'll be more questions, so we'll be happy to take them. Uh, uh, whether right now. Uh, after the presentation or during the, the networking session. Thank you. Thank you, Lorenzo. That's really interesting. Uh, hopefully for those who haven't seen this before, uh, I find it fascinating every time I hear what they're doing. So I'm sure for those of you who haven't seen it, uh, equally are fascinated. A few things for me out of that was you know, the, the actual physics behind the Crover itself. Um, it must have been a huge challenge to actually work out how that thing moves around in the grain. Um, but I see, you know, the real insight in terms of those 3D maps and how you can, you know, get that data onto a desktop or onto a laptop or onto your phone. And you can actually see where any problem may be developing that you can take some sort of intervention measure as a grain, um, as a, as, you know, grain manager. Um, there was a couple of polls running or one poll running. The first one was about challenges. And I don't know if we've actually got any information back from that yet that we might be able to share. Uh, if not, then we can bring up the panel and we can ask some questions of the panel, if that's OK. I'm not hearing anything in my ear from um, anybody about the, the, the poll, so I'm not sure. Um, so if we just jump straight into some questions then. So we've um, got a few here. So what are the current barriers to sampling in store? And I think this really, I think I'll take this to you, Robert, if that's okay. Because, you know, at the coal face, this is probably a challenge you face uh, on a daily basis almost. Uh, the biggest challenge is labor. And obviously at present, it's all manual. So um, uh, health and safety comes into that. Um, you're clambering over the top of, um mounds heaps of grain um you know which is not really ideal it's not so bad in an open store like ours on a um a, a solid floor but in bins uh is to my mind you shouldn't be on in on the top of grain in bins um if, especially if it's an enclosed bin you've got gas issues um hollows in that bin that you don't know about um so yeah um, it's just practicality of um, sampling grain and time restraints, uh, especially if you're a mixed farm feeding livestock, um, sheep, cattle all through the winter, and it's probably the grain store door is shut, and um, it's just a job that's probably forgotten about. I'm sure. I'm sure, John, you've got something to add add to that. Um, your experience? Yes, <clears throat> I I would agree with with Robert. I mean it. it <laughs> when you should be putting the most effort in is when you're putting the most effort in the rest of the farm and, and you know, getting crops in the ground or sowing cover crops or whatever it might be through the autumn. And, and that early monitoring the store is, is critical to make sure that you, you've not got issues developing. And it, nobody likes doing it. <clears throat> and um, I can fully understand why, having done it. Uh, and if it's, you know, it's, it's particularly unpleasant sometimes. So I think that, you know, it, it, it is uh, a labor issue um, and in people's minds there are more important things to be done uh, and, and and that's not always the case but that's how it appears so you know I was involved with one uh, issue where 600,000 pounds worth of grain um, went west because there wasn't sufficient monitoring um, or the resolution of the monitoring was insufficient to pick up the issue initially and then it was it was uh, totally beyond control after for that so it just just ran away completely um so what was a, a high value organic uh crop um actually ended up as a lot of it going to waste and some of it going to animal feed but um, the bottom line was it was somewhere around six hundred thousand pounds worth 
Um, so it, it, it doesn't take a lot for it to go wrong, but it does take a lot to, to monitor it. And, and it's, it's, you know, it's a decision people make. It's a, a risk reward thing. And maybe nine years out of 10, everything's fine. Uh, tenth year, something goes horribly wrong, wrong weather, branch through the roof, something like that. Maybe the grain store is not close to the farm uh, and suddenly it's all gone, gone horribly wrong. But on the other hand, it can be something very small. And it's just, you know, grain going in, one or two percent wetter than you think it is, so it comes off the dryer. Something goes wrong with the measurement, and if you don't follow that through, you've got an issue as well. So um, it's 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 just hard work, and it's laborious, and it's tedious, and and you know I can I've said it for thirty years, and I think some people responded, but I think and many others just <laughs> still possibly don't put the effort in, and and um, yeah, you you end up with an issue. Okay, thank you, John. Um, Another question we have here is what are the benefits of constant sampling versus just sampling it intake and unloading? So I think Lorenzo, I'll push that one your way if that's okay. Uh, yeah, I believe uh, a lot of the green storage guides and, and best practices, for instance, the AGCA guide that was co-authored by, by John uh, uh, details that uh, you should be sampling your grain uh, once a week that's although you know not everyone does uh, so that's really to do with making sure that you can keep an accurate eye on that grain now ultimately how often you want to sample your grain that depends on what the ultimate purpose is if you're doing it weekly most of the times it is just because you want to know what the condition of the grain is and so you might be able to jump that step with a kind of more accurate monitoring system like ours where you can still get a, an accurate picture of that grain uh, even without uh, taking it you know taking samples out of stock uh, depending on what you want to measure because uh, one key aspect of sampling grain is that it enables you to uh, to send a sample to the lab and carry out more advanced uh, measurements that we, we can't yet at this point provide uh, on board of the Crover. But we, we've initiated uh, recently and we've received some extra support from uh, from Innova UK uh, we, with, uh, with a few partners. We're, we're not really supposed to talk too much about it, but uh, I'll just say that we have a project starting next month um, to do with uh, more advanced uh, sensing capabilities where we we're trying to develop uh, a novel sensor that is attempting to to take a lot of the readings that are currently being done uh, in in the lab or only possible in the lab uh, to take them uh, you know on site in the grain store uh, so a, a kind of uh, you know grain lab uh, in the grain store as we as we say um, and you know eventually that would that would reduce the need to uh, you know to, to take samples for that for that purpose just to, to carry out more advanced analysis. Uh, sometimes you need grain sample store to, uh, to keep a record of what grain you had in store uh, to, you know, for accountability and to show to your, to your buyer or to your client what grain you had there in case um, you, know, you have any claim, uh, at least you can, uh, you can show uh, what you had in, in place. So ultimately the, the reasons are, are varied, but we, we started working on the sampling project because it was one of the most requested features of the, of the Crover and hence it seemed, uh, you know, there, there seemed to be enough demand to do that. But we'd be happy to hear from the attendees what is your uh, specific, um, uh, you know, uh, angle for sampling. Um, on that note, um, so I'm, I'm being told that we have a Slido poll uh, that is probably uh, attendees are probably finding it hard to to find. Uh, I don't know if anyone from the uh, from the AgriEP staff can uh, can explain how to find the slider ball because I'm not exactly sure. Yeah, likewise, I'm, uh, I'm uh, <laughs> I don't know what's happening in the back office, shall we say? Um, if it pops up, it pops up. If not, we'll just carry on um, for the time being. But I mean. Robert, I'm sure you've had your fingers burnt at some time that you've sent a, a crop off to um, what you think was your destination, only to have it delivered back to you again. Um, I suppose, yeah, what would you consider to be a realistic resolution for you at the moment? And what would be the benefits of having that greater resolution of testing, uh, monitoring of a store? 
Um, Real-time data uh, coming to a remote, whether it's your mobile device, your mobile phone, or desktop. Um, so you can monitor that 24-7. Um, I don't know whether there's a possibility of having an app on your phone that flags up your temperatures rising rather than decreasing, um, so you can monitor that. And just to touch on the previous question, um, you know, we're, we're talking about sampling all the time, but the sampling is only as good as the calibration of the moisture meter on farm or at the store. So I just want to highlight, make sure your kit that you use is calibra calibrated properly because one or two percent out can make make a huge have a huge detrimental effect on that grain in store, especially at harvest time when it's going into the the store. If if it's sixteen percent instead of fourteen percent, um, it could be a nightmare, and all the grain could be going west, as John highlighted before. And at the current um, levels of grain prices, that is something you just do not want. And it, it's all just about attention to detail. You know, just keeping your finger on the pulse and and being on top of the on top of the game. But if you yeah, if your equipment's not calibrated properly, um, you're wasting your time. Yeah, I'm sure that's correct. I mean, three thousand um, tons of grain. At, I mean, you said three three hundred pound a ton at the moment, uh, roughly. Um, you know, someone can do the maths probably quicker than I, but. You know, the cost of a decent, well calibrated moisture meter <laughs> certainly pales in significance in the value of the, the grain in that shed at the moment. Um, so, John, I'll ask you a question if, if that's OK. Um, so how does the, the, the sampling technology, what will the sampling technology improve operations and efficient sort of IPM management in store? Well, there's a big question. Um, so I think that the, I mean, the, the ability to, I guess, I guess it's the, the monitoring part. So it, it, IPM in general is, is, you know, it's it's about using all possible means of, of, of management, if you like, to, to against uh, pests and diseases in this case, so the molds and the, and the insects and the mites. Um, but it's, if you cannot measure what is going on, then you cannot understand what you need to do. Um, and if you know, it's if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. It's the old adage, and it's perfectly true. So I think that if you have the ability to understand at uh, a high level of resolution, then you understand what it is that you need to do, and whether that's about spot cooling, turning the grain, um, uh, you know, adding heat or trying to dry if you've got on floor drying or, or whatever you might want to do, or as Robert did, take the grain out of the store, run it through dryer or cool it and then put it back into the store um, if if you uh, can only do that from one or two samples a you you run the risk of, of missing it and therefore your management doesn't happen um, if you've got uh, a high level of resolution then you can do it on uh, the appropriate volume of grain so you don't then treat the whole store when it isn't necessary um, yeah I mean IPM doesn't exclude the use of, of fumigation uh, and you can go through the other uh, activities of, about treating the, the fabric of the store if necessary to, to try and um, reduce the, the impacts of pests in the first place. Um, so it's about putting all these things together and, and it's, it's having those measurements to have the confidence to let something alone as much as it is about having those measurements to indicate that you need to respond in some way. So it, it's, you know, IPM is knowledge intensive, data intensive, and you can't do it properly unless you've got the information. So the, uh, the, the, I guess the risk is that people would take inappropriate action and jump to a fumigation when it isn't necessary, um, although it is quite expensive, so you probably think long and hard about that. But uh, you, know, you, may, you may not take the appropriate action. And if you've got a contract that specifies it, it, it you, know, you mustn't treat that grain in any way, um, with with chemicals, then clearly you would lose value, and you'd have to sell it into a different market as well. Um, I, I hope that answered the question. Yes, thank you. Uh, we've got a question in the chat there about, and I'll direct this to you, Rover, uh, <laughs> Lorenzo. Sorry, that the as the crow unit goes deeper into the grain store, the pressure increases, and what is the maximum depth um, that you can safely operate or potentially operate? Yeah, that's absolutely correct. I mean, that's one of the, the main limitations that we're working uh, through right now. 
so the main version right now is a kind of that limitation of about uh, one meter if we're talking about the sampling one because that one has a, a bit of extra help in the propulsion let's say uh, that, that one can go uh, about two meters uh, but we're working on kind of improving that so the, the target that we're aiming for is uh, about eight meters because that's usually the you know the depth that you will find in uh, in a kind of tall flat grain store and also because in a in a silo or you know a kind of more uh, contained grain bulk where you've got uh you know larger high dimension that than a uh, that then a side dimension uh you have the what people call the crover effect so effectively where the the vertical stress reaches a horizontal asymptote so it stops increasing and any extra load is is carried by the walls so usually around kind of eight to ten meters is where we we see kind of no not much variation anymore in uh, in vertical stress so that's that's our target but yeah right now about one meter for the the main monitoring one and about two meters for the sampling one okay thank you uh, another question here about uh, potential demo days that you might be able to um, to do um, before it becomes commercially available. I think that's probably, again, one for either Lorenzo or John. Uh, and I suppose it's a direct contact to yourselves um, to do that. Uh, yeah, we were actually, uh, I mean, the initial plan was to hold uh, this, this event on, on farm, a robber's farm as a kind of on-farm demonstration uh, with the Crover. Uh, you know, due to the current uh, you know situation of events, and uh, and also considering that it's winter in in Scotland, uh, we uh, you know we decided to to postpone any of those demonstration events uh, towards the summer. Uh, but we'll be definitely running those. Uh, some with Agriepi. We're also planning to run some in uh, in Italy in case anyone is in Italy uh, with uh, you know with our Agrobo Food uh, uh, partners there. Um, so yeah, we, we are planning to have events uh, both in Scotland, uh, in England, to to make it easier for for people, you know, farther down south in the in the UK, uh, and similarly one in the north of Italy and uh, and a, a few in the in the south of Italy, the the two main granary regions there, which are uh, Apulia and uh, and the northern flatlands. Um, but yeah, if you like more details on events or to to be kept updated with those, uh, uh, definitely sign up for our newsletter on on our website and feel free to send us an email. Uh, I, I put my email address uh, at the end of uh, my slides as well, so that you know, in in case anyone wants to reach out, you can do it through that. Or there is our info at crover.tech email address where you can reach out with questions even after the event. Great, thank you. Uh, just coming back to the poll again, um, I can't see anything. It is running apparently, and it's somewhere over the right-hand side of your screen, but I don't know if we'll see the um, the output from this, um, even though it's very quick. Um, but I think probably we've run over time slightly, so I'd like to thank everybody for their questions. We do have a networking session now following on directly from this if you'd like to join that uh, otherwise there's going to be a video just playing uh, that we recorded as a bit of a uh, case study on crover um, that was filmed uh, with robert up and nisbet probably about a month ago now i think so um just want to say thank you to all the the for speakers and for the presentations uh, thank you for your participants um, joining us today I uh, just want to point you towards the Together We Can campaign from AgriEpi. If there are any tech developers out there who'd like to speak to us directly, you can do it through that link. Uh, but in the meantime, thank you very much. And we will see you in the network session in just a few seconds. Uh, Duncan, I don't know if you want us to take a last question. I think Nicolas just oh. posted a uh, last question. OK. Oh, sorry. Yes. Uh, how is data accuracy with current sensors at the moment? And do you have any? challenges on signal to send data out from the Crover when deep inside the silo. I hope you can read that as better than I read it out. Uh, yeah, so the accuracy for uh, moisture right now is about 0.4% plus or minus moisture content. And uh, the temperature one, uh, uh, yeah, it's usually kind of below that. I mean, uh, below 0.5%. Uh, plus or minus Celsius degrees. Um, 
usually quite a bit lower. But uh, I mean, the, the target that we set ourselves was 0 0.5 for both moisture content percent and uh, and temperature. Right now, the main uh, the main challenge around the sensor that we're trying to well, not really challenge, but thing that we're trying to improve is the uh, the response time of those uh, to kind of reduce it even farther and make the readings even more instantaneous. Uh, in terms of the, the second part of the question, uh, challenges on signal to send it out of the Crover, when um, that's uh, that's not particularly a problem with the main current version because it is uh, it is staggered. And uh, so the yeah, that cable has a, a kind of multi-function, if we may. Yeah. Great, thank you for uh, say I didn't pick that one up. So, uh, yeah, I, I think we'll, we'll have to leave it there. I'm sure there'll be other questions in the uh, in the networking session that you can direct to, um, in person. There'll be other Crover members of the team on that the networking session as well. So, um, thank you again to Robert, to John, and to Lorenzo. We're going to play a short video now, and then we will join you on the other side of the um, the platform. Thank you. We're here on this beautifully sunny but freezing cold morning on the borders of Scotland at one of our satellite farms, Upper Nisbet Farm. We're here with one of our partners, the Crove team, and we're here to see them demonstrate and do some further research on their grain swimming robot that's looking to revolutionise grain storage monitoring. My name is Lorenzo. I am founder and managing director at Crover. Uh, we are a startup based in Edinburgh and we've developed the world's first subterranean drone, or what we call a crover. So the main crover, it moves through grain. Uh, we usually say it swims through grain. It mixes the grain in situ as it's moving through them, which helps maintain the quality. And it also measures temperature, moisture and stock levels. So Crover, incredibly exciting, is a world first innovation. No one to this point has come up with a robot that can swim within all kinds of granular materials. So the Crover effect is a novel physical effect which I discovered during my PhD at the University of Edinburgh, which represents the first feasible method for locomotion through granular materials. Traditionally, investments in the farming and agricultural sectors have been focused primarily on the field and on the fork part of the supply chain and the middle has been forgotten a bit, which is why we feel that middle stream is the one with the highest inefficiencies. The Crover Robo and our technology can be applied more widely to any bulk, solids and powders enabling more efficient management of this type of materials with applications that were not possible before, as it was simply not possible to move below the surface of this type of environment. The main method used by most grain storage operators, if they do anything at all, is manual sampling by having a person physically walk on top of the grain bulk with a heavy and spear and taking samples or their measurements at a few points near the surface of their bulk. That is very tiring, time consuming and also pretty dangerous. So from a health and safety point of view, especially for larger companies with employees, that is quite a nightmare. Hi, I'm Robert Newell. I uh, farm here at Upper Nisbet. So our role with this Crover project has been providing access to this grain store and letting the guys come in when they want and use the grain piles in the shed to test out their robotics that they are developing. So the current challenge is on farm or whether it's at a central grain storage is um, temperature and moisture. So you need the correct temperature and you need the correct moisture to be able to store grain long term. The problem is that usually you're not able to control your processes or you know, the conditions of your bulk storage because you're dealing with such large quantities. The price of food, the price of grain, we cannot afford for wastage anymore.
about uh, 630 million tons of grain are lost every year during the storage phase alone, which is quite a significant portion of the global grain production. Uh, wastage could be hot spots, uh, grain heating, growing mouldy, mycotoxins growing in the store, uh, which at that point, that grain cannot um, enter the food chain. It's basically wasted product. So it's no profit for me. It costs money to get rid of. It's not a nice position to be in, to be honest. So we need tools in the toolbox to allow us to look after and store grain food safely on farm or at a central storage site. The system has multiple parts to it. At the core of it, you have the Crover robot that is connected either through wire or wireless, depending on the version, to a local control unit, which helps control the rover. It sends that data then to a central gateway where you have one gateway per site which sends the data back to our secure database and then eventually the data is visualized through 3D maps and histograms on our Saving Grains web platform. My name is Artem Lukyanov. I'm a mechatronics engineer and technical director at Grover. I think this is a very interesting problem. The grain, it behaves like a sand and a little bit like a water, but it's also different and it's also highly abrasive and it's also everything that we make needs to be food safe. So initially we started based on simulations and some initial concepts that uh, Lorenzo developed during his PhD. And then we tried to put them into the physical shape. There was lots of trial and errors. We've been here about 10 times to do various tests. It's really important to come and test uh, on the farm different versions and prototypes to get full feeling of the motion of the device. So AgriEpi, as with many of our projects, is involved in a number of levels on this. Primarily, of course, to partner Grover with Robert at Abenesbit, which has been particularly helpful given the size of his grain storage unit here. In the laboratory, we have a limited space and we only have like a small pool size. On the farm, the, the bulk is much more loose and there is more grain, there is a different effects. You could have different heels, different shapes. So quite often we test in the laboratory and the robot may work, but in the farm, it may not work or, or it could be the, the contrary as well. Of the many services and facilities that AgriEpi Center can offer our members and project partners is access to our satellite farm network. A lot of technologists working in this sector find it very difficult to find partner farmers who are able to not only offer up the ability to run testing and trial on, on their farms but are set up and interested to work with innovators. So we've got a network of 24 farms across the UK across all different sectors in farming. Being involved is really exciting. You know, it's, it's all about the next generation in, in farming, younger generation, getting people to come and work within agriculture. And all these things can make agriculture, can make working on a farm more sexy. We are involved in project dissemination. So making sure that the vital research and development that happens on projects like this then gets out um, to a wider audience, whether that be other farmers, technologists, or in the case of this project, vital customers within grain storage and monitoring. The impact that Crova or the robotics that they're developing could make our storage facilities streamlined. So what I'm looking for is a tool that will send me moistures and temperatures of bulk grain at any time, real time, whether it's through an app on mobile phone or to the cloud-based system to the desktop in the farm office. It's going to save time on me sending staff into the grain store and taking individual samples, which is a bit of a laborious job. So savings using our system uh, currently are heavily dependent on what our operator does, but we've estimated that you would be able to save on average at least 80% of losses compared to current practices. Potentially even 100% if you've got the right systems in place and if you act in a timely manner. In terms of grain storage, we're enabling accurate integrated pest management practices which help maintain the quality of the stock and make sure that the same quality of grain that goes into storage is the one that comes out. We're nearly two years in lockdown, COVID, things have ground to a halt in the country, but agriculture hasn't, producing food hasn't, and we need to produce food and keep it safe. We proposed this project together with AgriEpi. We applied in the UK uh, for, for this project. We were lucky enough to be 
awarded the grant and then we started the project with AgriEpi and East Scotland Farmers. The reason AgriEpi is so important in collaborative projects like this is everything from our extensive member network and network beyond that, our series of hubs and research and development centres across the UK, our satellite farm network, all of these things come together with our internal expertise around technical and project management and allow us to help organisations like Crover to connect with the right people, whether that's across industry or whether it's farmers like Robert, and also to help them to connect with customers and understand how to get from ideation through to commercialisation of their innovation projects. Thanks to the support from AgriEpi, from Robert and a lot of other organisations, we've been able to overcome a lot of the challenges that startups have to face. We at the AgriEpi Centre are part funded by Innovate UK and this project was also funded by Innovate and was part of their ISCF Transforming Food Production Fund. So this project has been going roughly two years at this point and is coming towards the end of the actual project. Crover as a product has got a lot of legs in it. Crover have already raised some further capital through Crowdcube and have another grant fund coming through. There's a lot of more development to happen and we're very excited about the next steps for Crover. The finished product, we are hoping to make it at least IP rated, so it's protected against the dust and humidity or moisture or water ingress as well. It will be a game changer for the industry going forward. And there's way more that we want to do. Oh yeah, I'm, I'm very excited.